begins there to uh, establish itself there, and it goes all the way through the book of Acts. Now, what will happen is, is that that's called the church age. That's what we're in right now. The same as it was there with the Acts of the Apostles that was established and started. And the churches uh, in Acts chapter 16, this church at Thessalonica, this letter here we're going through, the whole story about that is over there in Acts chapter 16. So you've got, that, you've got that going through with a timeline. At the end of this church age, at the end of this church age, which could be today, or it could be 10 years from now, or it could be 30 years from now. You say, Brother Jack, that's a long time. <laughs> Who would have thought we'd be here right now? <laughs> Nobody would have thought we'd be here in 2014. And I can remember saying, well, we may be there in 2008, 2010. I remember saying, but by 2020, there's no way we'll make it to 2020. <laughs> We're on our way to 2015. So the Lord knows more than what we know, and the church age could be over, you know, today. But it could, it may be over in 2030, I don't know. But we're going through the church age right now. What's going to happen is at the end of the church age, there's going to be a catching away, which is what we talked about last week in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The dead in Christ, uh, the dead in Christ and us which are alive and remain, if the Lord came back today, we would be caught up into heaven to ever be with the Lord. That's the rapture of the church, okay? That's different than the second coming. The second coming is what? That's Jesus Christ coming back on this earth. Now, so what you have is you've got the church leaves. That starts the judgment seat of Christ in heaven. We would go to heaven and the judgment seat of Christ is going to start. You say, well, what's going to go on happen on the earth? That's when the tribulation starts. So for seven years, what you're going to have is you're going to have the tribulation down here on the earth and you're going to have the judgment seat of Christ that's in heaven. At the end of that seven years... Jesus Christ is coming back, and He's coming back on a white horse. That's the day of the Lord, and we're going to get into all that stuff this morning. And then at the end of that, then you're going to have a new heaven and a new earth, and Revelation uh, 19 there where you've got the marriage supper of the Lamb, and all that stuff's going to happen. And that's the timeline. And so where we're at this morning in chapter 5 is we're talking about the rapture, okay? We're talking about the rapture. We're talking about the catching away of the church, us being caught up to be with the Lord. Now, it's going to use this reference, the day of the Lord, okay? Now, the day of the Lord is a reference all the way from the catching away or the rapture all the way into the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's considered the day of the Lord also. And we're going to look at all these Bible references this morning. And all I'm trying to do is to get you to paint you a picture here that, all right, we're in the church age. What, the next event that's going to happen is the rapture. And then there's going to be a seven-year tribulation. And then... Jesus Christ is coming back to earth. That's the second coming. So you have tribulation, or you have rapture, tribulation, second coming. That's the way it's going to be. And all that together is considered a part of the day of the Lord. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse 1. The Bible says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that are right unto you. The times and the seasons of what? Chapter 4. We just finished the... Uh, Rapture. So that's what he's talking about. Look at uh, ver chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. See there, he's talking about the rapture, what he was just talking about in the chapter before. He says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord... So see, there's the reference to the day of the Lord in connection with the rapture of the church. So it starts right there at the rapture, and it, you, it may say the day of the Lord and be talking about the second coming. It may say the day of the Lord and be talking about the tribulation. It may say the day of the Lord and be talking about the rapture because it takes the whole day of the Lord, starts with the rapture, and it goes all the way through the second... through the tribulation relation to the second coming of Jesus Christ, okay? So, just read these verses down through here. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And that's talking about the tribulation. And they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. 
Ye are all the children of Lot. Talking about saved people. Talking about the people that was going to be raptured out in chapter 4. Ye are all the children of Lot and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, now verses 6 through 11 here, which we'll get into next week, are going to tell you what to do since you ain't got to worry about going through the tribulation. You ain't got to worry about all this stuff that's going to happen bad. He's saying now, because of that, because of what God has done for you, verses 6 through 11 is going to tell you what you're supposed to be doing. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day, Christians, that's going to be raptured out, be sober, put it, put it on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. All right, hold your place right there. God's not appointed us to wrath. What is the wrath right there he's talking about? Look over at Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 6 is the start of the tribulation. You've got chapter 4. You've got the church leaving in chapter 4. You've got the judgment seat of Christ in chapter 5. And chapter 6, which is going to be going on at the same time, is uh, the start of the tribulation. And that's when you've got those uh, four horsemen that show up. And this is the false white horse rider right here. This is the Antichrist. He says this, And when I... And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. This ain't the white horse of Revelation 19. This ain't the same horse, all right? This is the Antichrist. He's showing up during the tribulation. And the Antichrist always shows up, and he's trying to pretend like he's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it says, And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And that's what the Antichrist is going to do during the tribulation. All right, and he says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And he goes through there, and he begins to open these seals, and he begins to... Uh, uh, talk about what's going to happen on the earth. Look down at the... Uh, go down to verse 14. It says, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks, the mountains, and the, said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's the second coming. At the end of the tribulation, he's coming back. And you know why you're not going to have to worry about that? <laughs> because you're going to be with Him. <laughs> you, ain't, you ain't sitting here and letting Him land on you. <laughs> you're up there with Him coming back. All right? That's why. And when He comes back, it's called the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 17, For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse 6. Let's read it again with verse 6. Now, here's what, you're, here's what you've got in your mind now. You know during the tribulation at the end of it, He's coming back to release His wrath on this earth. That's what He's coming back to do. Now, verse 6, Therefore let us, the people that left in chapter 4, not, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. That's the armor of God that we're supposed to be putting on. He said, and he says, and why? He said, verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, <clears throat> that whether we wake or sleep, Remember verse uh, chapter 4? He said those that are uh, asleep that God's going to bring with Him, right? For whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. We're not appointed to wrath. So... I don't know if you're here this morning and you're constantly worried about going through the tribulation and am I going through the tribulation? Some people say we're not. Some people say we are. Listen, you know what God said? You ain't got to worry about the wrath of God. You're not going through the tribulation if you're saved. If you're saved here today, you, God's not appointed you to wrath but to salvation. 
And that salvation is, is you're going to be caught up out of here when this tribulation starts. You've got the judgment seat of Christ that you're going to have to deal with, and it ain't going to be easy. But you're going to have to deal with the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where the work, your labor, what you've done here on this earth, that's going to be judged. And every man will receive in his body the things that he's done, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And so you're going to be facing the judgment seat of Christ in heaven while the tribulation's going on. But guess what? We're not appointed to wrath. You're not going to be down here during the tribulation. All right, according to verse 9 there. Now, let's go back. So that you kind of got this idea in your head how this thing works and this timeline and what's going to happen. Now, now we're going to go through and start looking at some references to what I was showing you, all right? First... Here's what I said. I said at the judgment seat of Christ, a reference to the day of the Lord can be a reference to the judgment seat of Christ. And you know that because the context of the judgment seat of Christ is your work is going to be judged. That's what's going to be judged is your work that you've done here. Uh, some things that you're going to have, you're going to get, we went through before, you're going to get crowns. All right, those crowns that you, that you can earn, one of them, is look up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 19. One of the crowns that you can earn is people that you've won to the Lord. And the reason you know that is because that's what Paul says right here in chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. Look at verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? All right, so what is your crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye, who? This church. <laughs> are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming. And so that crown you're going to get is at His coming, at the rapture, okay? After the rapture, you go to the judgment seat of Christ. Your works are going to be judged. You're going to receive a crown for everybody that you led to the Lord. You'll get a crown for that. And people that have not led anybody to the Lord, they're not going to get a crown for that. <laughs> they're still going to get to go to heaven, but they're not going to get a crown for it. I mean, this ain't like it is down here on the earth, you know, it ain't junior pro basketball where everybody gets a trophy at the end of the year. <laughs> the Lord ain't like that. You know what the Lord does? The Lord says, if you work, you're going to get a crown. And if you don't, you won't. That's the way the, word, that's the, way the Lord works. Now, look over at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What will happen on this earth is a sinner, somebody that sins and won't get right with God, at a certain point, you know what will happen? God will turn them over to the devil and just let the devil have his way with them for the destruction of the flesh. They're not going to lose their salvation. They're still going to go to heaven. It's still one of his children. But what God does, and even in Romans chapter 1, people get turned over and the Lord begins to just take his hands off. And when God takes his hands off of you and lets the devil have his way, guess what? You're in trouble. And if you're sitting here this morning and you're, and you're dilly-dallying around and, and not being serious about God, if all God has to do is take His hand off of you because the devil ain't got no mercy on you. And if God takes the only thing that's keeping you from going down is the grace of God. That's the only thing. If God decided to just take His hand off and say, go get Him, you've seen what happened with Job. The devil don't wait. He don't wait around. He'll come after you. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And what happens here is verse 1, it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. <clears throat> and so what's going on here is you've got this problem going on in the church, and Paul's getting on this church at Corinth because they're not dealing with this. Now look down in verse chapter, in verse 5 here in chapter 5, 5, 5. He says this, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. All right, so what's going to happen right there is, is the destruction of flesh is going to happen here, but the Spirit and everything like that's okay. It's going to the judgment seat of Christ. Right there, talking about the, uh, at the, in the day of the Lord Jesus. All right, look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And we were talking about the context of the judgment seat of Christ is getting a crown for people that you've won to the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 13, he says, For we write none other things unto you than what we read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end, as also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we... That we are that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also 
or hours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so you see that rejoicing right there, which was, you take that with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, you're our rejoicing. You're our crown of rejoicing. And you see there it says at the end of that verse 14, the day of the Lord Jesus. So the first two references there, 1 Corinthians 5, 5, 2 Corinthians 1, 14, references to the day of the Lord. Those are references to the judgment seat of Christ. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. So the day of Christ entails a whole time frame from the rapture all the way through to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1. Now, remember, what's going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ is work, your works, your labor. Philippians 1, look at verse 6. Being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you. Now, that's not a work of grace. That's not Calvinism, okay? That's not, oh, I'm starting to think about being saved. God's beginning a work of grace in me, and He's going to save me. That's not what that's talking about. That's not, okay? It's not talking about uh, God saying, or, you know, Paul saying, listen, you know, you're lost, and here's what's going to happen. One of these days, if you're one of the elect, God's going to start a work of grace in you. Then He's going to save you whether you want to be saved or not. And then you're going to come and ask the Lord to save you. A Calvinist believes this, whether you know it or not. A Calvinist believes that God saves you before you ask. There's churches in this county. Here's what they believe. They believe that God saves you before you ask. You say, are you kidding? No, really. That's what they believe. They believe that you are dead in trespasses and sins and you can't even believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because you're dead. And God has to regenerate you. He regenerates you and saves you whether it's your will or not. And then once He saves you, then you come to the altar and you ask God to save you. Now, does that make any sense? <laughs> that's what they believe. Now, that's not what He's saying here in verse 6. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for you to him, to, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense of the con and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Now, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. All right. Now, the day of Jesus Christ there is a reference to the judgment seat of Christ. Now, if that was God starting a work of grace in you, then you wouldn't be saved until the day of Jesus Christ. When's the work over? A good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So it's not even anywhere close to that. Not anywhere close to what that's saying. Look down in verse uh, 10. <clears throat> that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense. You may be sincere in your walk with the Lord without offense. What this has got to do with your walk on the earth. In verse 11 it ends up, or verse 10 it ends up, and without offense till the day of Christ. So that's the day of Christ right there is a reference to the judgment seat of Christ and it's a connection with work. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Chapter 2, Philippians 2, look at verse 16. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And there's a connection there to labor, to work. That's the judgment seat of Christ. And that's why he's going to be able to rejoice at the judgment seat of Christ. So the judgment seat of Christ in reference to the day of the Lord, you've got 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, 2 Corinthians 1.14, Philippians 1.6 and 10, and then Philippians 2.16. So the day of the Lord is a reference to the judgment seat of Christ. Now the day of the Lord, now and you know that's going on in heaven. And so what's going on on the earth during that time in the judgment seat of Christ is a tribulation. All right, look at 2 Thessalonians. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And get Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Yes. <clears throat> 
2 <clears throat> Thessalonians chapter 2. St. Thessalonians chapter 2, look what he says in verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as us, or as letter, or nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. So you see the context there. He's talking about the day of Christ. Some people thought the day of Christ is already happening. He said, don't worry about it. Let no man deceive you by any, mean, any means. For that day, the day of Christ, shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's the tribulation. All right, that's going to be going on. So the context here is... The tribulation. So the day of uh, Christ is going to happen at the rapture. And once that thing happens, you're going to have the man of sin that's going to be revealed. And look what he says. Who opposeth and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So that's going to run all the way through the tribulation there. And look at verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity, which is the Antichrist, doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So that goes all the way through the tribulation to the second coming right there. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send strong send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So you see there there's going to be a group of people during the tribulation, they're going to be there and there's going to have an opportunity during the tribulation for those people to get saved. Now those people during the tribulation now you say, well, am I going to be deceived? You ain't in the tribulation. You're at the judgment seat of Christ, okay? So that's not you right here. This is going to be a group of people through the tribulation, which is a reference to the day of Christ, and they're going to have an opportunity to get saved. But God's going to send a strong delusion that they're going to be a, believe a lie. Now you say, well, ain't that God picking and choosing who's going to be saved and not? No, it's not. What he's doing is he's, strength, he's sending a strong delusion. They still have the opportunity to choose yes or no. They still have that opportunity during the tribulation. And during the tribulation, according to Revelation chapter 14, it's a setup of faith and works, according to Revelation 14, 12. Now look at Matthew chapter 24, just to show you if God's sending a strong delusion that they may believe a lie. <clears throat> You say, well, I'll just wait till the tribulation and then I'll get saved during the tribulation. <laughs> if you're not going to accept it right now and you know the truth, you're going to be in trouble. Sit there. You don't want God against you. God's for you right now. He's wanting you to be saved. You get to the tribulation, those that rejected the truth according to 2 Thessalonians, He's going to send a delusion that you're going to believe a lie. You'll have God against you. The best thing to do for a man is just get saved right now. Matthew chapter 24. The context here is the tribulation. Look at verse 29 first. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So that's the tribulation here. Look at verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That's not the end of your life. People use that verse right there and say you, got, you can lose your salvation because if you don't endure the end, you're going to lose your salvation. Everybody sitting here has heard somebody say that. It's not talking about the end of a life. It's talking about the end of a period of time. It's talking about the end of the tribulation. This is a tribulation passage. People that are here, they do have to endure to the end. That's why it's so hard to be saved during the tribulation. It is faith plus works according to Revelation 14. And so you have a... You have a reference there to the day of Christ in 2 Thessalonians, and the context is the tribulation all the way to the second coming. So you see this day of the Lord is going to start at the rapture, go through the judgment seat of Christ, through the tribulation, and it's going to culminate at the end at the second coming of Jesus Christ. All right, look at uh, look in the Old Testament now, the second coming. Get uh, Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. And what's going to happen is, is you're going to begin to see <clears throat> what's going to happen during the second coming. Now, 
So what I've showed you so far is, is the judgment seat of Christ, okay? Follow me here. 1 Corinthians 5, 5, 2 Corinthians 1, 14, Philippians 1, 6, Philippians 2, 16. All those are a reference to the judgment seat of Christ. That's going to happen. You say, what's the importance of this? Here's the importance. Most of the people in this county are going to tell you there's just one general resurrection. At the end of it all, God's going to come back and He's going to separate the sheep from the goats and all that stuff. Listen, there's more to it than that. <laughs> there's more to it than that right there. It ain't over at the rapture. And I know it's going to make a bunch of people mad in this county, but here's what's going to happen. You've got the judgment seat of Christ. I just gave you four references to the judgment seat of Christ and could give you 20 more right now. There is a judgment seat of Christ. You are going to be judged according to your works and you're going to receive a crown. There's five crowns you can get according to the Scriptures. That's going to, be, that's going to happen. That's there no matter what. No matter what anybody says, those references I just gave you to the judgment seat of Christ, that's going to happen for a saved man and woman. All right. Then I showed you a passage there to the tribulation. There's going to be a seven-year tribulation. People say, we're going through the tribulation right now. You're not going through the tribulation right now. Amen. Devil's not. They, they say, well, the devil's bound right now. The devil's not bound right now. <laughs> I talked to him this morning. <laughs> I heard him. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it is on church day. The devil's around. He's not bound right now. The second coming of Jesus, that's not happened right now. It's going to happen. The devil will be bound. So I showed you the tribulation passage. Now what I'm getting ready to show you, you is Jesus Christ coming back to this earth because what you know you've heard Jesus Christ ain't never going to set foot on this sin cursed earth again you've heard that well guess what according to Zechariah guess what he's going to do the Bible says he's going to set foot on this earth again and it's in the scriptures whether we want to believe it or whether we don't God don't care you know uh, it's in the Bible and I believe it so it's so. Well, it don't matter whether we believe it or not. It's in the Bible and it's so, no matter what we believe. And so what we're going to look now is at the second coming where Jesus Christ is coming back at the end of the tribulation, after the judgment seat of Christ, after the tribulation. Look at, uh, <clears throat> let's look at Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13, look at verse 6. How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. That's what we read over there in Revelation chapter 6. At the end of the tribulation, people are going to be running and hiding and praying for the rocks to fall on them when Jesus Christ comes back. That's not going to happen at the rapture. When He comes back at the church, you know what it says? It says it's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be out of here. People's going to be looking around. It says, Behold, I'll show you a mystery. Nobody's going to know what's going on that's left here. They're going to look around. In Revelation, when this happens, you know what the Bible says? Every eye shall see it. Every eye is going to behold it. So there's a difference between the rapture and the second coming. This is the second coming. They're going to see this. Therefore shall all hands be faint, verse 7, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be uh, in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at the other. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath, see that word there, and fierce anger. You mean the Lord's going to have anger? <laughs> you ever see that sign? The Lord's coming back, and boy, is He mad. He's not going to be the lowly Galilean. He's not going to be hanging on a cross. He's coming back to make war, according to Revelation chapter 19. You say, the Lord is going to be like that? I thought He was just all about love. Negative. No, quit listening to Hollywood. You know what He's doing? He's coming back to make war. He's going to wreak havoc. The best thing for you to do is to be on His team. <clears throat> It says, And they shall be afraid. Let's go to verse, uh, verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. <laughs> now see, that's not ever happened. That ain't happened. <laughs> verse 11, it's going to happen. It's in Isaiah. It's going to happen. Verse 11, And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. <laughs> it's going to be bad. 
it's going to be bad. And people that think that ain't going to happen, guess what? Well, so and so, these people just get away with it. Hugh Hefner and then Playboy and Flint with uh, Penthouse and these guys, listen, if they don't get saved, they're going to pay for their sins. They ain't getting away with anything. If they're still here during the end of the tribulation and the Lord comes back, He's going to be trampling them down. That's what's going to happen to them. Look over at Jeremiah chapter 46. And people tell you this ain't even in the Bible. Look at Jeremiah chapter 46. They've got to ignore the whole Old Testament if they're going to ignore the second coming of Jesus Christ coming back to this sin-cursed earth. Uh, Jeremiah, or yeah, Jeremiah chapter 46. Jeremiah chapter 46, look at verse 10. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall devour, and it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. He's coming back. You know what's going to be on his sword? Their blood. That's who's going to be on their sword. Isaiah, that's Jeremiah 46. Look at Joel chapter 1. Go a couple more books over to your right. Joel chapter 1. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Joel chapter 1. Now you say, what are these guys here? These are prophets. They're telling what's going to happen in the future. And they're saying it like they're seeing it right now. Verse 15, Joel 1, 15. Alas! For the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. It's coming. The day of the Lord's coming. Look at uh, Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. You see there? It's coming. Look at verse 11. Joel 2, 11. And the Lord shall utter His voice before His army, for His camp is very great, for He is, uh, for he is strong that executeth His word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? Let me tell you, nobody. Nobody can. Best thing to do is be on His team. Look at verse 31, Joel 2, verse 31. <clears throat> You see this about the sun and the constellations and stuff, which is going to happen at the second coming. It's all in these different references. Uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's not happened. It's not going to happen at the rapture. That's going to be a mystery. It's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's not going to happen during the tribulation. It's not going to happen during the judgment seat of Christ. That's happening at the end of that. When He comes back, that's when all this stuff's going to happen. Look at Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. You say, why are you showing so many verses for? Because they say it ain't in the Bible. That's why. Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. Look at verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. That's what's going to happen at the second coming. Look at Obadiah. Right before Jonah, a couple books over there, past, in between Amos there. Obadiah, Obadiah. All these books over here that people don't like to read. <laughs> Obadiah chapter 1. Obadiah chapter 1, look at verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain... You know what's over there right now? The mosque of Omar. That's what's over there. The Muslims are over in Jerusalem. And they think they got it going on. And guess what's going to happen? 
the Lord's coming back <laughs> and He's going to take care of that. It looks like they got it. It looks like they're in control. It looks like they're taking over everything. But God begs to differ. Look at verse 16. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down and they shall be as though they had not been. You know what God's doing? They're, you know what they're going to be drinking? <laughs> they're going to be drinking His wrath. That's what they're going to be drinking. Look at Zephaniah. Go to your right. A couple more books to your right. Zephaniah. <clears throat> Zephaniah chapter 1. Zephaniah chapter 1. Look at verse 7. Hold thy peace at the presence of of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're coming to the supper, all right. They're going to be the supper. <clears throat> Zephaniah chapter 1. Zephaniah chapter 1. Look at verse, uh, at the end of verse 7. He says, For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guests. Look down at verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the, do of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of what? Wrath. God's not appointed us to wrath. Praise the Lord. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. That's what the day of the Lord is. Look at Zechariah chapter 14. Two more books over to your right. Zechariah chapter 14. The Lord ain't going to set foot on this sin-cursed earth again. That's what they say. When they deny the second coming of Jesus Christ, coming back here and setting up His reign on the earth, they deny 500 references in the Old Testament. They just take their Bible out. Look at Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1. <clears throat> Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations. You know what I've got marked on top of there? America. America's turning its back on God. He ain't sparing America. The only way you get spared is to get saved. For I will gather all nations, that means America too, against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Well, that's bad. <laughs> Look at verse 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when He fought in the day of the battle. Verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Where's it at? Which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. You believe he's going to come back on this sin cursed earth? Yeah. He's going to land on that mountain, and that mountain's going to split in half, and there's going to be a big valley. And guess what? The Lord's going to begin to wreak havoc on this earth. Look at Isaiah chapter 63. Got two more references. Get Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah chapter 63. Go back to your left. Isaiah 63. This is what Isaiah saw. Isaiah 63, verse 1. <clears throat> Isaiah 63, 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? What that is is people that... They used to get that juice out of those grapes. They'd put all those grapes in a vat, and they'd stomp them grapes, and it would get the juice out of them. And that grape juice would splatter all over their clothes. <laughs> this is the Lord coming back, and He's stomping on those people, and the blood's coming up on Him to the horse's bridle, and He looks like somebody that's been on a wine press. That's why they're asking Him here. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Verse 3, they asked Him that question. <laughs> I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Why? For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. <laughs> He's coming back. <laughs> Look at Revelation 19, and we're going to finish over here. Revelation 19. 
And you read all that stuff there in the Old Testament about how bad this is going to be. You better be glad you're saved. Amen. And then this right here is what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation chapter 13, the beast, the Antichrist shows up and they look at him and the world wonders at him and says, Who's able to make war with the beast, with the Antichrist? This is, look at Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. This is the good white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. See, he's going to make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Here you are in verse 14 if you're saved. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses is clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, Zechariah 14. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Uh, that's the um, uh, thousand-year reign. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's my God. <laughs> is He your God? I hope He is. I hope He is. All right, let's take a break.